Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Finneran's Wake. I am with all humility and with unwavering devotion to the cause of great conversation, your faithful friend and host, Daniel Finneran. I'm joined today by a very special guest with whom I fear I'm quite undeserving to be speaking. Professor Ed Larson is a man of diverse talents and prodigious intellect with whom I'm very lucky to be able to spend some time. A graduate of Williams College, uh, Ed obtained his JD from Harvard Law School before pursuing a PhD in the history of science from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Now, were I to list for you all his published works and all the awards with which they've been justly crowned, I'd risk losing your patience. His celebrated oeuvre comprises over a dozen books addressing topics as diverse as Faith and Science, Evolution and Creation, George Washington and Benjamin Franklin, The Age of Exploration, The Constitution, and most recently, The Tension Between Liberty and Slavery During America's Founding Era. And you can read about that in his book, American Inheritance, Liberty and Slavery uh, in the Birth of a Nation. His 1998 book, Summer for the Gods, in which he examines the famed Scopes Monkey Trial, captured the Pulitzer Prize. He's currently a distinguished professor in history and law at California's Pepperdine University. Professor Larson, I do apologize if I omitted from my introduction any of the accolades with which your lengthy and impressive resume is overflowing, but I thank you very much for joining me today. It's a pleasure to be with you. We're recording this episode on the 18th of April, the very day on which, in the year 1775, the British regulars, the notorious Redcoats stationed in New England, were preparing their historic and perhaps ill-fated march on the towns of Lexington and Concord. In the pre-dawn hours of April 19th, a discerning group of patriots caught wind of the British advance and alerted their fellow colonists of the regiment's movements. No sooner had news spread that the British were coming than hostilities broke out at Lexington and later at Concord, and the American Revolutionary War had officially begun. Professor Larson, I ask of you a simple question. For what purpose or purposes did our colonial forebears fight this war and do you think that we've been good stewards and inheritors of the causes for which they fought? A uh, good thing to think about, especially on at this time, because back then the battle at Lexington Concord was viewed as really the beginning of the war. Uh, more so even than the Declaration of Independence later. And of course, a year later, that same date was evacuation day when the Washington and his troops forced the British out of Boston. Um, of course, that's all celebrated today by, um, by the Boston Marathon. That's why it has the date that it is. Um, of course, it's moved on a Monday. Um, down deep, the colonies had drifted apart. They had become a separate people, as is noted in things like Th Thomas Paine's American uh, um, Common Sense and uh, the Declaration of Independence. They drifted apart, but the final straw, that, as they say, the straw that broke the camel's back was the, was the taxation without representation, which they viewed as a fundamental infringement of their liberty because they thought that as English people, there should not be taxation without representation, that your representatives should decide whether there's taxation. And if somebody other than their representatives, in that case, parliament, got to decide how much the tax was, even though the initial tax on um, stamp tax or the tax on, um, which was actually a tax on paper goods produced in America, or the import taxes levied not on the whole empire, but just on 
imports into the colonies. If they could do that, then they could do anything. They could raise it up. And so they use the rhetoric of slavery. They have enslaved us. We, as they repeatedly said, we are no better than their enslaved beings. And we're not raised as that. We're English people. There's English blood, whatever that is, flowing through our veins. And they can't take away our inalienable or inherited or native or natural born. It would depend on who's talking or God given rights as English people. And so in that sense, the way they conceived it, they were fighting for liberty. Now, as I said, it built on some other things and other things it built on would, would be the proclamation of 1763, which prohibited them from settling the West, even though their initial colonial charters, such as those for Virginia or the Carolinas or Massachusetts went West to the, from sea to sea, or at least to the Mississippi River, and they cut them off and they viewed that what made Americans Americans was the frontier, the open land, and that was taken away. So there would be other, there were other actions of limitation, but down deep, as I said at the beginning of this little talk, was that they'd grown apart and they now viewed themselves in a way as more American as Americans, or at least as Virginians or, or uh, New Englanders, then they viewed themselves as English. And therefore, they, because they'd grown apart, because the nature of living in the colonies was by nature free. That is, there was land available, there were jobs available, there was economic opportunity. You could rise up like a Benjamin Franklin from being a, a poor indentured servant to becoming a wealthy printer. Um, those, that freedom did not exist in England because you were basically trapped at your class level. Whatever your parents were, you were basically going to become. The rich were the rich and they got to go to Oxford and the uh, people born to work in the towns or, 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 or work on the manors, you know, there were the manor owners and there were the uh, quasi serfs and you're basically trapped. And so, and there was only one church and you weren't very engaged with it while in America, there were many churches and there was a competition of ideas for religion. So in all those ways, America had by its very nature of living on the frontier. And you also had a sense that you or, you or your parents or your colleagues were creating this. Of course, it couldn't have happened, but the, the charters came from England and there was England to back you up. But you didn't think of that. You felt that I opened that frontier. I cut down those trees. I built that fence. I created this. I drove off the Native Americans from the land. I did this. I did that. So you I'm, combine all those things. There was a sense that we did this and we're not going to now become the tools of British imperial policy. And the taxation without representation was the straw that broke the camel's back. Yeah, and, and quite a back that was broken. <laughs> it, it's, it's funny when you look at the original maps of the chartered colonies, you see a Virginia to which you, you made uh, reference and you see that it's boundless. There's this vast, I guess they would call it a terra incognito, this unknown mm -hmm. territory. And they didn't exactly know how far it expanded, extended out to the West. So yeah, the, there was this presupposition that, you know, a, a continuation of their enlargement could could go on and on and on until eventually they, they would meet a possible ocean, <laughs> as was the case. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, you're absolutely right. There was this feeling after the Seven Years' War that they were now suddenly constrained into this um, 
sort of provincial territory between the Appalachian, the Alleghenies, and and the coast. Um, so yeah, that one can understand that restlessness with that comes with uh, the inability to expand, to stretch one's limbs, and and a growing strength. Like think of yourself as a as a as a growing man, uh, you know, in your adolescence when you're it's just starting to come into your own. You're feeling the you know the movement of your muscles and the um, the, the desire to to run around and, and lift and throw and have that stifled. I like to think of that as as sort of an analogy to what uh, to what our our colonial forebears in experienced. Um, so uh, it's been contended uh, most most vocally by the authors of the New York Times immensely popular 1619 project that the Revolutionary War was waged with the primary goal of preserving the institution of slavery. Now I I noted that. That went unmentioned in your response. So do you agree with the project's contention that this aim more than any other roused the colonists to revolution? I'm not an expert, I'll be perfectly honest. I'm not an expert on the, the uh, 1619 project. I mean, I read it when, when it was in the New York um, Times and I just didn't read it quite that way. I just didn't read it as, and maybe it was there and, you know, we all bring our own presuppositions to what we read, but I didn't read it as arguing that the main reason that the, um, the Americans, the Patriots, whoever you want to call it, however you want to term it, went to war, because it was still only a fraction of the people living in the United States that revolted. Um, I didn't read it. That's not the way I, I read the 1619 Project. Um, the 1619 Project was, was a work. It starts at a different time than my work. It has a different lens. It's looking at the history through the lens of race. I'm looking at it through the lens of liberty and the lens of slavery. That's a little different. Um, I thought the two works complemented each other, um, but of course you're gonna make different findings. Uh, and I don't start, I'm a historian. So I start from the primary sources. And so my book was not inspired by any other book. It wasn't inspired by the 1619 Project um, I was working on it before that, and I just worked from the primary sources um, of what I see in those primary sources from the period, um, focusing somewhat on the lens of liberty and slavery. So any sort of, um, by the time I read the 1619 uh, Project, I was so, probably already so immersed in what I had found that I read it with that bias. So I'm really not prepared to comment on it in any deep way because I'm not a, I never reviewed it. I've never um, followed it. I, I found it as a, I enjoyed it. I thought it added, um, what I liked about it was it, um, was the reaction to it. And thinks that it inspired a lot. It's like the musical Hamilton. It got a lot of people interested in history. And I think that's great. Yeah, I agree completely with that last statement. Uh, if nothing else, it sort of awakened an entire um, wing of academia, certainly, and, and I think the larger public, and caused them to review the literature a little bit more and to, and to examine these ideas that were being put forth in, in, in generally very eloquent prose. Uh, you know, the writing of, of most of those authors is, is quite good. Um, you know, their arguments are, of course, a different story with which we can we can quibble, um, but uh, I tend to agree with with your analysis as sort of a layperson who absorbed them kind of with the with the the geist with the the spirit of the moment that seemed to to overtake uh, much of the much of the country at the time of their publication. Um, I want to turn to a peculiar person who I think deserves more notice. And that's Crispus Attucks, a name with which a larger share of the general population uh, 
I think has become more familiar thanks to uh, works like yours. Now, just prior to this conversation, I rewatched a clip from HBO's acclaimed John Adams series in which the Boston massacre is vividly depicted. In a brief but touching scene, John Adams, played by the inimitable Paul Giamatti, stoops down and feels the pulseless body of Crispus Attucks. As you mention in your book, your most recent book, Paul Revere's engraving of the massacre omits the fallen figure upon whom Adams lays so tender and solicitous a hand. And yet, as you explain in your book, Adams, in his defense of the British soldiers, was only too eager to implicate Attucks. I was absolutely floored by this. So I ask you, what is the true story behind the Boston massacre? And is poor Attucks to blame for its incitement? We don't know the exact story, but no account puts the blame on him. There's no account at all. There's also no account that would suggest that John Adams was anywhere near the spot or touched the pulse of anyone. Um, that was artistic license. Uh, John Adams was not there. That, that we're sure of. Um, and as for um, the Paul Revere image, we know that wasn't accurate. We know that was a polemical device. John, um, Paul Revere was part of the, the uh, Sons of Liberty group that um, was committed to revolution or at least standing up for uh, um, American liberty at this time. And the from all the accounts at the time, and there were a lot of accounts at the time because a trial was coming and both sides collected affidavits from literally over a hundred affidavits from anyone who had any sort of eyewitness or personal experience with the event. And John Adams was not one of them. And so we have this, these voluminous collection of, of uh, deposition taken under oath um, by, some of them taken under oath um, by people on, um, people who observed it. And Atticus was generally agreed to be the first to fall. Certainly he was shot among, and was one of the five that died there. Um, probably the first to fall. There is no solid evidence that he was an attacker. He was a tall man, uh, 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 stood out probably because he was um, a mixed race. Um, ten, the general opinion is he was mixed race, Native American and, and um, African, that he had been uh, enslaved in uh, Framingham, that he had escaped from slavery, pro worked on a, this was pretty common, when you escape from slavery, so you're not recaught, you sign on as a sailor. And then he was a sailor and he was back in Boston. It appears that when the trouble started, he went out to watch it, possibly led others out to watch it. Uh, the question is, where was he? Virtually no one puts him as there appears to have been attacker. The Boston massacre occurred because there was a lot of tension at the time, troops had been sent to enforce the taxes and the people didn't want to pay the taxes. That's the, the problem with the taxes that had already gone on by now for four, it was five years after the Stamp Act was first imposed and then withdrawn. And then there was the uh, Townsend tariffs and they were um, uh, being withdrawn already at this moment, but the word hadn't re reached Boston. These were troops sent to collect the taxes, quartered in the homes. Um, a lot of these poorly paid troops took side jobs, um, menial sort of menial tasks. That was taking jobs away from local workers, um, especially um, younger men. There was a lot of tension because these soldiers were being quartered in the homes. They were collecting taxes, um, which Americans thought they shouldn't have to pay, and they were taking jobs. So there'd be sort of rivalry there. And now we had a nice snowfall 
and here was a century out in a very visible place protecting the customs house where taxes were being collected and groups of people not including Atticus had gathered were taunting this the soldier throwing snowballs at them apparently um, and the British sent a small group there to come to their defense with loaded muskets and um, the taunting and and back and forth continued um, somebody probably went up and um, played a, made a closer confrontation to um, one of the uh, soldiers and it ended up even though the officer was trying to stop them from reacting they were being taunted shouts to fire fire were came out from somewhere quite possibly from the viewers not from the testimony was not from the officer in charge and the gun started firing and we ended up having this massacre and in that battle Atticus fell probably the first of all uh testimony tended to have him standing by the side sort of watching he wasn't a local it was probably good sport to watch but he was a tall big target and uh the conclusion was that he was in some way targeted for that shot and so there was the boston massacre is at first reports all list very quickly list who he was initially he had apparently been using a pseudonym because when he was in town he didn't want to be recaptured um and it took a little while for them to figure out not his pseudonym but his real name but the fact that he was of mixed race that was out that was in the early newspaper reports it was only later when um paul revere who's a printer um well he he made he wasn't a he was a silversmith coppersmith he was a he was an engraver and engraved a illustration and when it was printed then you color it in and uh Atticus is shown there, but he's not shown tinted in. He's shown as white. Ah, okay. So it's not a uh, not a perfect uh, depiction of Atticus, but he is he is shown at least in the in the oh, image yeah. by Revere. Ah, there he is shown in the appropriate place. One of the prints that survives. I think there's twelve or fourteen. One of the prints, the one I think held by. I think it's the one held by the New York Museum of the New York uh, Met, the Met, Metropolitan Art Museum, does have him tinted in by hand. Huh. The others, all the others, including the all the others that I've seen, the one at Yale, for example, the one at Harvard, um, and the one seen at the time because it became a sort of a handbill, um, it was widely printed, um, have him as white. With the printing where there are other things are colored and you know, the, the, these are illustrated uh pictures yeah it's fascinating and it leads into my next question about propaganda in the early stages of the republic so in the collective memory of this nation the events that transpired on that night that you just described uh, will forever be the boston massacre mm -hmm. and yet as you note in your book a royalist governor by the name of Hutchinson published a contemporaneous pamphlet entitled, and I love this, a fair account of the late <laughs> unhappy disturbance in Boston. <laughs> I think this is just a perfect example of uh, establishing a narrative that will stick and that promotes your agenda. Uh, now we see the same thing today, but for instance, on the left, maybe the events of January the 6th were an insurrection, whereas on the right, they're regarded as a, you know, an overexcited, uh, well, the overexcited antics, let's say, of, of an unruly uh, group of trespassers. So maybe without commenting on, on that more modern uh, propagandistic uh, battle, can you comment on the role of propaganda in the age of our founding? Sure, certainly. Um, yeah, it was. It was certainly what Paul Revere was engaged in, uh, what the British uh, Lieutenant Governor um, or uh, Hutchinson was engaged in. Um, 
who was a strong loyalist, even though he was born in Boston, um, and brilliant man, by the way, um, they were engaged in a propaganda battle. Um, newspapers at that size were, were um, propaganda, engines of propaganda. Um, and with the illustration, um, that was oh, perhaps the first great act of political propaganda. Maybe, maybe you go back to Ben Franklin's famous snake um, that was cut in pieces, unite or, unite or die. Um, from the uh, the French and Indian War, uh, fifteen years earlier, uh, but I think this picture, this image created by Hancock, was spread. It didn't just stay in Boston; it was spread, and so was the pamphlet that both sides put put out um, that characterized this event in dramatically different points of views because the Boston Massacre was a perfect vehicle for pushing the issue of liberty and the opposition, the dangers of, of capitulating to the British. That this was the British, how the way British would treat us. They would shoot children, they would shoot whoever. Um, to maintain and collect their maintain their power and collect their taxes, the nobody nobody suggests that the illustration, that famous illustration, that was accurate. It was a piece of propaganda, and the thought is that of why you care whether one of the people was was part black, part African, part Native American, you, was probably not that they mind it because all the, a lot of the initial reports, including the reports by, the, by both sides, no matter how they wanted to use it, frankly mentioned that he was mixed race or um, who he might be. And it does, but it doesn't really advance if your idea is to foment a revolution. It doesn't help your among white British people. It doesn't advance the cause if you show the injured people as others, as Native American or as enslaved African Americans or simply as, um, as John Adams liked to call them when he was defending the British soldiers, a rabble of Negroes, um, Irish cars, yeah, and, um, and he had a couple other words in there. But to him, if, if you're trying to defend the British soldiers as he was, you dismiss the crowd as, as, sailors, jack tars, Irish tigs. It was Irish tigs, jack tars, and Negroes. Oh, and saucy lads. Those were the four. And That's the worst, the worst just, time, saucy lads. It, you you got to love the language of Adams. He's such an irascible fellow, but yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely, he is. So if you want to dismiss him, you paint him that way, which is how the Lieutenant Governor Hutchinson painted them. Um, and you say they're not the proper British. But if you're trying to foment a revolution, you more like the picture of paintings of Paul Revere or the accounts um, from that, from the, the, the Sons of Liberty we're presenting. And that was, they're us. They're shooting us. They're shooting us. And uh, so you're going to present it differently now. John Adams was, of course, was, I think he was a member of, I'm sure he was a member of the Sons of Liberty. He certainly was a patriot. Um, but he took the other side in the trial after the damage was done, after the service, after the British had repealed the, the, ta the Townsend tariffs, after they pulled their troops, after they got what they wanted, the trials came later. 
and they wanted by this time they wanted to calm it down so instead of presenting it the way samuel adams or paul revere would have initially presented it now john adams was taking the other side to tamp it down Did and so I suddenly it was saucy saucy lads and jack tars sounds like a noble crew among whom i'd, I'd want to no number myself uh, did, did I'd want to be with the I, I'd want to be with the saucy lads, especially if it was, especially if it was, um, say the um, uh, uh, St. Patrick's Day, and we're going out drinking in Boston. I'd want to be with the, the, oh, the Irish yeah. jigs and the saucy lads. Absolutely, I'd be welcomed with with open arms with my last name. <laughs> but uh, did did Adams? risk some reputational damage by uh, by by defending the British no everybody knew what he was doing he was he was a he was a certified patriot uh, they knew what the game was and he was put to the task by the by the uh, Patriots they wanted to have one of their own because if one of their own is handling the the lawsuit, or not even one of their own. It was a team of lawyers. He was just one of the team. Um, they're going to make sure it doesn't hurt them. That it doesn't hurt the revolutionary cause. So no, he didn't. He See, didn't that's that's fascinating because because he's held uh, not only in the legal community but I think in the the broader American mind as as someone uh, an exemplary figure. Um, completely devoted to justice and the law, who who took upon himself this this unpopular case and defended these, um, you know, detestable British soldiers. So that's fascinating to me to know that he really it was really more um, manicured. <laughs> it was orchestrated a little bit more. Oh, he definitely was put up to it by the Patriot forces that they wanted they wanted to control. The way this was presented and now their goal was to present themselves as uh, boston is respectable because they'd gotten what they wanted they'd gotten the troops withdrawn and the taxes pulled all, all the tax on all the taxes except of course the tax on tea but the others were lifted right right uh, so would you say just in in closing was is that the most successful and enduring piece of propaganda that America has ever produced the Boston Massacre? Oh, I'm not one to um, jump to extremes. I'm sure we've had um, many other and very effective um, pieces of propaganda. I, I, uh, Pearl Harbor, I suppose, was a pretty effective piece of propaganda. Um, the Gulf of Tonkin uh, uh, attack which was as um, which was more fraudulent than the Boston Massacre. At least somebody died in the Boston Massacre. The way Lexington and Concord were portrayed. Oh, probably the best of the Revolutionary Era would have been the way they presented Washington's Crossing of the Delaware. That that saved the Revolution by, um, I mean, it was a you know a couple guys on some boats going across on Christmas night and attacking drunken German. Uh, mercenaries, um, but boy, they after the way to strip it of all its American grandeur. <laughs> well, after the American army had been totally routed in battle after battle, battle of Long Island, the battle of Harlem Heights, the battle of White Plains, um, the capture of Fort Washington and Lee. I mean, they they were just kicking Washington's butt all across New York and New Jersey and. According to all reports, Washington had a pretty big butt to kick. Um, he was um, sort of um, he was sort of pear shaped, and um, so uh, uh, and then to take this little crossing, which the British viewed as insignificant, and make it into a great. We're going back. We're taking back. We backed into New Jersey. We're now on the edge of New York, standing up there in Morristown. If you ever go to Morristown, you go up to the heights. Yes, you can see, you could see the, now you can see the skyscrapers. Back then you could see the church towers of New York. Um, but no, that was a propaganda coup of, of uh, monumental uh, 
ability and standings. Yeah, and a mightily successful one. It's funny, that uh, unflattering body type, that morphology that uh, Washington bore, I don't think was concealed in a lot of his pictures. You you get that sense that he is <laughs> he isn't your your traditional virile apple shape with a big, you know, broad chest and shoulders and a slim waist. He he does appear <laughs> more pear shaped now that you mention it. <laughs> Maybe that's well, why the busts, the busts are always best of him with that stoic uh, countenance. <laughs> well, he had a stoic countenance because he didn't, you know, he had false teeth and he had to keep them in by keeping his mouth shut. But yeah, but it made him a great, he was apparently a, a really, really good equestrian. Um, it made him answer, ride well on a horses. Answer, he and a very big good horse. He needed a big a horse. Answer. But you know, with that, with that bottom half, he could really ride on a horse. And apparently he was, he was excellent. And back then, um, the, your ability to ride a horse um, sort of stood in for athleticism in general. And Washington, Franklin was a good equestrian. Jefferson was phenomenal. John Adams could barely ride on a horse. He had, that's why he had to be in a carriage. Um, and people held that against him, where Washington's apparently on a horse Washington, he was monumental when he just stood there because he was, you know, he's built like an oak tree. He was big. Um, and he was 6'2", whatever, which was big back then. But you put him on a horse, you put him on a big white horse or something like that. My gosh, apparently he was just dang impressive. Yeah, he, he would look like uh, <laughs> like an Olympian, uh, like, a, like an Olympic god or of some sort. It's somewhat dispiriting to me. I'm a shorter man. I would think that you know, we as a jockey, maybe we'd have more success with, with the 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 horses. But you're talking about Jefferson, who was a large man. Washington, who was a tall man. I don't know how tall Franklin was. He, Franklin you know, was not. Franklin was on the tall side. He wasn't as tall as them. But yes, he was. He was fairly tall, and apparently he was. You don't think of him as a, but he was. He, but he was. He was a swimmer. He was a, a phenomenal swimmer. swimmer. Yeah. Now, when he. It, Correct me if I'm wrong. Famous. In his youth, he was a swimmer, and Washington was a was a dancer. Was very good at dancing. Right, he was. Washington was also a swimmer, which was unusual to swim back then. Franklin used to give swimming lessons, and he'd go out swimming in the Delaware River. You can imagine it every day when when there wasn't ice on it. But his most famous, he, you know, he went back and forth to England and France often, and he would jump off the boat in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and swim around the boat. Yeah, well, he uh, he understood the the currents better than anyone. <laughs> he was yeah. taking advantage of them. <laughs> oh man, yeah. I mean, these little um, little pieces of their biographies I find the most interesting, and they really give a lot of color to to these characters that we think we understand, uh, but but really don't fully until we read books like yours, where where you really delve into their lives and and um, uh, approach them from every single angle. But I want to I want to turn now to the Constitution. So you state in your book that the Constitution embodied a pragmatic mix of lofty ideals and lowly compromises. Uh, you proceed to quote the great Northern abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison, who denounced in rather invidious terms the Constitution as a covenant with death and an agreement with hell. Now, on the contrary. Friends to the Constitution, like Madison and Hamilton, they exalted the Constitution in terms reminiscent of England's Magna Carta. They called it a great charter of freedom in which the true principles of Republican government could take root and flourish. So uh, toward which pole, the, the, the Garrisonian or the Madisonian, does your appraisal of the Constitution lean, or is it right in the middle? Well, to put on the other side, I mean, of course, I don't think either Hamilton, I think both Hamilton and Madison would have viewed the Constitution as a pragmatic document. Um, it was much different from the original Virginia plan, uh, which Madison would have preferred. There were a lot of compromises, such as giving every state um, equal representation in the Senate that Madison really deplored. Um, 
there were a whole, there were a whole variety of other things that Madison absolutely deplored that he didn't get in the Constitution. And of course, Hamilton wanted a much stronger presidency. So he, there were lots of things that he didn't like in the Constitution. But one person who, if you're thinking about Garrison, Garrison, of course, was later. Um, and Garrison's looking at the Constitution as applied. And by the time he said that, the Constitution had become a vehicle for, uh, with the fugitive slave laws that were passed under it, um, had become a vehicle for extending slavery west, at least south. And it was threatened to move north as well. Meanwhile, at the exact same time, though, his most famous disciple, um, more than his disciple, but certainly he had brought up Frederick Douglass. Certainly he'd been a he'd been a, a vehicle for the rise of Frederick Douglass, even though in the end, by the end, Frederick Douglass exceeded his mentor in significance and importance. Frederick Douglass took just the opposite viewpoint. Um, and he viewed, while he acknowledged these compromises, he viewed that the Constitution could be a vehicle for liberation. And the only possible vehicle for liberation, which was more like Franklin's view of it. Franklin, by the time he was at the Constitutional Convention, he was president of the America's first abolitionist society. He was governor of Pennsylvania when the Constitutional Convention took place. He was one of the most important delegates there, one of the 12 or so that really made a difference. Um, he didn't like the uh, uh, compromises, but he viewed I think he viewed at least most of them as necessary to get the South to join. But he had this belief that once they were in, then the Constitution could work to end slavery, which was exactly the reason that Patrick Henry opposed it. Patrick Henry at the, at the Virginia uh, Constitution Convention led the opposition, joined by others, um, including former Gov Governor Benjamin Harrison and future President James Monroe. And their argument was, their main argument was that this, one way or the other, despite the compromise in it, will lead to the abolition of slavery. The end is going to be that slavery is abolished due to the Constitution. In contrast, uh, 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 slaveholding federalists like James Madison, like Edmund Randolph, the governor of Virginia, like um, um, the governor of South Carolina, and or the Pinckneys of South Carolina, Charles and Charles Coatsworthy, um, they were arguing just the opposite. They were arguing that because of the compromises, slavery is safe under the Constitution. Not that the Constitution authorizes slavery. What the Constitution, they would argue, is it protects state-sanctioned slavery. So I think people are asking the wrong question when they ask, is this Constitution pro-slavery or anti-slavery? It's neither because if the Constitution had been pro-slavery, promoting slavery at the national level, the northern states would never have ratified it. And everyone at the convention knew that. Because by this time, most of the northern states had already abolished slavery. Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, um, Vermont, um, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and, and New York and New Jersey were on that way. And already, the Congress had banned slavery in the Northwest Territories. So it never would have been ratified if it was a pro-slavery document. Same way, though, it needed nine states. The Southern states were ever more committed to slavery in their states. And so the Carolinas, Georgia, Virginia, Maryland would never have ratified the Constitution if it was anti-slavery. So what the compromise was, was that we didn't have a single national government 
which was the Virginia plan would have created a national government by its terms. It said we created a federal government where certain things were reserved to the states and they were the what they said were the local things. So sure, education, health, those things were reserved to the states. But the whole reason we had a federal constitution was so that slavery was one of those local things. And so what it protects is state sanctioned slavery. I don't mean by state being federal government. I mean state government. So states could have slavery. And I do think that that, so in the end, even the abolitionists like Governor Moore there, like Governor Morris or Benjamin Franklin or um, um, Elderberg's jury of Massachusetts, true, true people absolutely committed to, uh, against slavery. They went along because they sort of figured it didn't make anything any worse because if there was no constitution, there would still be slavery in the Southern states and it didn't allow it to spread. And maybe they had the hope that in some way, as expressed by, by Wilson of, of Pennsylvania, who was also one of the big 12 there, as it were, um, he claimed, I think this was more propaganda, but he claimed to push in that ratification in Pennsylvania, which was, of course, Quaker Pennsylvania was one of the big anti-slavery states. He said, once we get them all in the Constitution, this will be a, a vehicle. The Constitution will be a vehicle for ending slavery in the states. And of course, in the end, he was right. 14th, 13th Amendment was under the Constitution. And that was sort of the view that Frederick Douglass ultimately adopted. So that's a real long-winded answer. But it's a complicated, um, it's a complicated story. And there are, um, I agree with historians like Paul Finkelman, that maybe there were more compromises than were needed. The South really needed the National Union. They were not going to go off and have their regional confederation lightly. That's what Patrick Henry wanted. But Patrick Henry didn't have a majority. As long as it people like Madison and Rutledge and, and um, uh, the Pinckneys, who were all quite respected Southern slaveholders, as long as they were convinced that this would protect slavery in the South, the Southerners, for all the advantages, because the big advantage of the Constitution was had nothing to do with slavery. The reason why we got a Constitution was before that, each state was totally sovereign, including on economics. And to grow the economy, we needed, like the common market, we needed a national economy, a national market economy. We needed to break down the, the tariff barriers and, and other trade barriers that stood between every state. We need to make one national trading union. That was the big thing. That's why Franklin and Washington and Hancock and all these people supported the Constitution. Let me let me ask you, uh, whose construction of the Constitution was most in alignment with your own? Because I, I'm fascinated by the diversity of constructions of, um, of appraisals of this of this document. You know how you can have one section thinking it eventually to abolish slavery and to threaten it, and the other to to uh, allow it to endure. So uh, among those maybe two or three groups that you mentioned, you know, in which camp would you put yourself as you understand the Constitution? I don't think most people back, I don't think there were that many camps. I don't think many people followed Wilson. Most people would read Wilson and roll their eyes. He's dreaming. And, or he doesn't believe in himself. But he was the one who argued this is going to be able to end slavery um, in the whole country. I don't think he believed it himself. That was propaganda, try to get it passed in Pennsylvania. Um, I, I don't think that that was a plausible argument then. I think what the, and the Southerners never argued this would lead to the making us a, a slave nation. 
uh, a nation that uh, uh, approves slavery everywhere. All they thought is that we have protected our own states so we can be part of this national um, economic union with an effective national army and uh, that will be powerful enough to push the Native Americans out of the West and we can settle the West because they had no army, they had no central taxing authority. That was the main goal, opening the West. Um, so I think they thought we have adequate security to defend the South. And key to that is the three-fifths compromise because it gives relatively equal, the best they could tell the three-fifths compromise, it's a made up number, three-fifths, but it means it, what the number they thought would do would make roughly the same number of members of the House of Representatives from slaveholding states as from non-slaveholding states. The same was true with giving each state one vote because that would very quickly lead to 16 and 16 because they knew there were 13 then, but they knew Vermont Kentucky and Tennessee were going to come in right away. So if you draw the line, that is eight and eight. Um, and that sort of political bargain and the three-fifths compromise goes over to the election of president because that's why we have an electoral college. It was invented so it served the interests of the slaveholding states as opposed to direct election of president, which is what Ben Franklin wanted, Benjamin Franklin wanted. And most Northerners want a direct election of, pre of the president. Um, so when you put all those things together, I think the South had a very good arguments that this will preserve state, san state sanctioned slavery in our region and allow us to extend it west into Kentucky, Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, um, those states when they came in the Union. Um, but they didn't think they could extend it. Now, uh, it was a radical like Patrick Henry who would argue, no, no, they're going to they're going to abolish slavery. But he always Patrick Henry had a, his own agenda and he really did want a southern confederation um, rather than a national union. So I think that the which do I think I think that both sides would basically agree that what we've what they've created here in the Constitution is a pragmatic document that would provide for a national commercial union, a national military, something could open the West and yet allow um, uh, certain states to be um, have slavery and other states not. Now, this is what Lincoln would argue, that a house divided cannot stand, basically arguing that this is too big an issue to bridge. We cannot in one country have um, um, slavery and non-slavery. Uh, Governor Morris was arguing that at the Constitutional Convention. He said, this can only lead to civil war. This is too big an issue. Madison agreed it was a huge issue. Elderbridge Jerry agreed. Uh, what others said is maybe it isn't. So we look at today, what's like it? Well, the closest thing, and I think it's short of that, would be abortion. And can America survive as is envisioned in the Dobbs decision of a country which is half no abortion and half freely abortion? Because that's what we've gotten to within a year of the Dobbs decision. We have roughly half the states banning all abortion, effectively balancing all abortion. And we have roughly the other half moving way beyond what Roe versus Wade covered and are even more open to abortion than under Roe versus Wade, where there could be restrictions, you know, in the second and third trimester. Um, I'm going to interrupt just for a second because you perfectly preempted <laughs> one of the questions I wanted to raise. <laughs> so, so hold that thought. You, you're, you're, I hate to jump in front of all this momentum that you have, but I also want to be respectful of our time. Uh, so uh, along with your role as a 
as an historian of early America, uh, you're also an historian of science, so far as I understand it. Um, in the first quarter of the 20th century, the public was engaged in the fierce debate to which there appeared to be no resolution, and that was the debate over the theory of evolution uh, or the belief in creation and which of the two was most suitable to be taught in American schools and, and which should really take precedence in the American mind. And it seemed like at the time that, that there was no reconciliation to be had between the two. And the drama played itself out most famously in Tennessee where the Scopes Monkey Trial, about which you write in your award-winning book, Summer of the Gods, was held. So while this debate no doubt lingers that vying um, you know, creation and evolution, we mm -hmm. seem to be enmeshed in new scientific and moral battles. And this is precisely what you were just talking about, but I wanted to, um, to know, you know what you consider to be this era's most important scientific and, and moral battles in which we're engaged as a public transgenderism and, and abortion are the two that leapt to my mind as I was um, compiling these questions and thinking about these prompts. So I know I interrupted that, that momentum that you had, and this is basically the same question, but maybe you can expand on that now with, with, my, um, with my introductory question. Sure, I think that's an interesting point. I think we have come up with a compromise that has bridged over the creation evolution teaching issue pretty handily. And that is um, the, when those issues arose, basically your choice was, I mean, the only option was public schools. And now we've created all sorts of voucher programs and um, homeschooling, right? Every state allows homeschooling. I think every state does, most do. Most, many have charter schools, many now fund parochial schools. There's been a huge upsurge. Back then, the only parochial schools were a few Catholic schools and cities, and now they're Christian schools in every Middlesex village in town. And um, therefore, people now, there's an option that you can, you can go to a school that teaches evolution, or you can go to a school that teaches uh, creationism. And it was never really an issue in college anyway. It was mostly a um, parental control and how your kids are being um, raised. Um, now the bigger issue is, are they gonna talk about um, gays and trans in the, in the schools? Um, so, but again, the out is vouchers, the out is um, homeschooling. And that seems to have settled, you know, quite down the issue. And so we don't seem to be fighting that much about it. If I had to think if it was a science-based issue, I would think climate change would be the, the biggest one right now. Um, because abor abortion, I don't, I view that as a religious um, issue, not a scientific issue. And um, climate change, there are, there is a contingence that argue that there isn't scientific evidence. We saw a little of this, by the way, also in the um, in the vaccines, or not the vaccines, but the, um, well, I guess they were vaccines for COVID or whether COVID was even there um, or how it was transmitted or whether mask works, whatever the, where, um, whatever the COVID related restrictions, but they've sort of gone away with COVID related restrictions. Um, that was temporary. Climate change is still there and I do think that that is divisive, but what makes abortion somewhat similar to um, the, the debates over slavery is you get to the question of can, an, Lincoln's question, can a nation exist half free, half with slavery? Maybe it could at the beginning, but by the 1750s and 60s, there was so much more communication. There were telegraphs, um, the mails, the mail, mail routes were more, the railroads. There was so much more interaction. And there was such a rush to settle the West 
And then, of course, what ruined the whole plan of division was the Dred Scott decision, uh, where now the, the Supreme Court sort of out of the blue, it wasn't even being argued in the case, decreed that you couldn't have slavery in any of the territories. So that upset the compromise that some areas were going to be free. And that you, some I'm sorry, slavery. that you couldn't prohibit slavery in any You couldn't area. prohibit slavery. So you yeah. suddenly, all the territories um, could have slavery. And indeed, if you take the logic of Dred Scott, you know, Dred Scott was originally taken to Illinois, a free state. And so then you could say, yeah, they could even take their slaves to a free state and that they had a right to. So the whole idea, we became so much more of a nation that you weren't able to keep it apart. Now, will that issue, that issue seems with the most recent decisions, I don't know when this is, people are gonna to listen to this, but just a week ago or two weeks ago, um, a federal court issued that you couldn't, that, that uh, the abortion pill was banned everywhere in the United States, everywhere, not just in states that had banned it. And that is sort of reminiscent of the Dred Scott decision in the sense that it's suddenly, if you had the compromise that the author of Dobbs, Judge Alito was saying, well, now this whole issue of abortion is gonna go away because states that don't want it can end it and states that want it can have it and all is gonna be quiet. That's the house divided against himself. It does do you, work in some issues, but if it do doesn't work in this, guns do you, are the similar in the sense that if you have a state that has all sorts of freedom with guns, well, people can carry them across lines. Same way with the abortion. If you want, can you just go across the state line and get an abortion or is the state going to prohibit that? And suddenly the intermeshing ends up creating a real um, challenge to um, states' rights. Yeah. Uh, do you think that Alito was disingenuous in his belief in the the sort of peaceful um, upshot of that decision? I don't know. I don't know. I could see arguments both ways. I do not know. He could have honestly viewed it that way. That could have been um, a cover and his real goal is to abolish abortion nationwide. But I honestly don't know. I could also see how he really would believe it. Yeah. I, I mean, I tend to, to, to think the best. Uh, so I would like to believe that um, you know the the latter was his was his intention i want to finish with one question and again you've been <laughs> extraordinarily generous with your time uh, you mentioned in the epilogue of your latest book that you enjoyed unexpectedly fruitful discussions of liberty and slavery in the revolutionary era with your spouse and two children uh, now it gladdens me to know that while cramped together <laughs> as a family during covid you were able to have what must have been stimulating conversations like this without totally driving each other insane. Uh, so this question is a simple one and a personal one. What came of these discussions? You call them fruitful. What fruit did they bear? And, and did they at all influence the way that you approached this, this book? Talking about, I find talking about something or writing about something, articulating it helps me in thinking through an issue. There may be people who can do this totally in their head. But for me, if I can write it, or if I can say it coherently to another, it tells me if there's something there. Because if I can have an idea, but I can't write it out, then I suspect there's something flawed about that idea. And it's the same way with articulating it. And I, you know, my kids were in their 20s, young, young, lower 20s then, and um, uh, they're both very smart and they both had, a, had finished college and had a good education. And there was nothing else to do as you know, how often can you have Zoom conversations with friends? Um, and they're seeing different angles to things, um, uh, angles that reflect their more recent education at one, one in the University of Chicago, the other at 
uh, University of California, Berkeley, and other perspectives. And it makes you think more closely and it makes you want to defend your interpretation or be open to changing your interpretation. And one thing nice about talking to your family is you're less defensive because honestly, you're happy if they're right and you're wrong because it's your own offspring that turns out to be brighter. And of course, we all want our offspring to be better than us. In my case, that's not hard because they are better than me. I wouldn't sell yourself too short. <laughs> no. I mean, I, I, I agree completely. I think oftentimes, uh, and especially during COVID, so many of us did the opposite and sort of retreated into ourselves. And, and uh, we were there um, imprisoned with our own feelings and our own thoughts. And, you know, in, your own, in one's own mind, an argument might seem perfectly reasonable and, and ironclad. Mm -hmm. But if it's never given voice, if it's never articulated to another, then you don't truly know how convincing it really is or how strong it really is. And that's one of the great things about having these types of conversations. Uh, you know, oftentimes my my mind is is blown, first of all, by the brilliance of some of my my guests, such as yourself and these interlocutors who I'm very lucky to have on here. But but it's also changed uh, so many times, uh, and it 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 really is something. And I I say this all the time it's something that we're just lacking and we need to be able to to bring these thoughts into some sort of articulation put them out into the world and know if they have some stolidity or or if they're if they're feeble if they're lacking and and they need adjustment we're so convinced of our own <laughs> rightness all the time that what you and your family did i think is absolutely essential and i hope that more families uh, take your example I, hopefully not in the time of a global pandemic but in more tranquil times they'll they'll take the opportunity to to talk and to listen <laughs> so well we, well I'm one sorry. of the great joys of the, of covid was i mean my my kids had moved on they came home during covid um why pay for an apartment in wherever you are in uh, minneapolis or in the bay area when you could be uh when you can't go out anyway so it was an enormous advantage, but I agree with you. And one of the reasons why I like to do this sort of conversation, and I find this with your, with you um, as well, is that usually people who are having conversations like this, and I have been able to have dozens on this new book and scores on my earlier books, is that if I can have the opportunity, think of an opportunity for me to have some intelligent person read my book and then discuss it with me, ask me questions about it. I can learn new, I can learn from that process. So I thank you. Oh, well, you're most welcome. And I've already been <laughs> encouraging others to read it. And I will certainly put a link to its, um, you know, Amazon availability in the show notes below. That being said, though, are there any other social media platforms on which people can visit you or get in contact with you? No, I'm not. Um, I am not much on the ability to do social media. So, um, but the book is available. If they don't, if they don't have, if you don't want to spend the money, it should be in a library. I hope it is. And uh, libraries still exist, I believe. I think it's come out now. Audio for people who like to just listen to something while they're commuting. Um, it should be available in all those sources, and Amazon is a place it is. But also your local bookstore, if you have a, especially if you have a locally, privately owned, family owned bookstore, those are a treasure. I um, I commend them to your listeners. Oh well, thank you, and I and I will echo that commendation. Yes, I absolutely encourage everybody if it is uh, you know local and available and and open go to your local bookstore and, and certainly patronize them. Uh, well, so with that, Professor Larson, I thank you again for being so generous with your time and for um, producing what is another great work. And I plan to go back now and read <laughs> some of your prior uh, publications. Uh, but until then, I wish you all farewell um, from Finneran's Wake.